Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you will enjoy today's master class, uh, which is about the future of the internet. The master class will be presented by Chris Stakridge, uh, 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 who is the uh, manager of the external relations of RIPE NCC uh, organization. The rest, please. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for coming. I, uh, yeah, my name is Chris Stockbridge. I work for the Right NCC. Um, it's my first time here at and first time in Armenia actually, so I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for the welcome. Thank you for all showing up for this. Um, I wanted to just get a feel of the room here. Like, can I ask people to put up their hands? Who actually works in the internet as this sort of technical person here? Anyone? Okay. Okay, and who uses the internet? Okay, but most of you, I'm guessing all of you. <laughs> we'll assume that most of you use the internet. Um, a bit of background about myself. Uh, I'm from Australia originally. I worked for the Right NCC for 12 years now. Um, and before that, I worked for three years for APN, which is the Asia Pacific sister organization to the right NCC. You'll hear a bit more about that um, later in the, in the presentation. Uh, my background in that sense is coming from a very communications kind of direction. Um, I'm not an engineer, I don't have a technical background. I came into APNA really with no idea that there was this whole system of internet architecture that involved people flying around the world making policies, doing all this work. Uh, it's something that even today, even with everyone using the internet, is kind of invisible. I think most users don't necessarily have an understanding of how all of that stuff works. But it, is, it does affect us all. The choices that technologists or internet service providers or governments make about how the internet is governed, policies that are made, actually affect you as users at the end of the day. And there are opportunities for you to get involved in that. There are opportunities for users who get a little bit more educated, who understand what's going on, to actually contribute to that policy making process. And that's probably the point I'm, I'm looking at here. It's why, um, rather than just the future of the internet, uh, I've called the talk Shaping the Future of the Internet Together. Because I think there's a lot going on in the internet. And you can talk about IoT, Internet of Things. You can talk about artificial intelligence. You can talk about big data, you can talk about cyber security. I'm not really going to talk about most of those things because that's what there are people who do those things and it's not me for the most part. But what the organization that I work for and the community that I work for does is actually make the policies that help govern what we do with those new technologies. That say, okay, the Internet of Things is taking over and it's, it's providing all of these new opportunities. How do we make sure that that's fair? How do we make sure everyone can have access to that? How do we make sure that this is not sort of one or two giant multinational corporations taking off and running with the internet? We actually make sure that the internet is something that all of us can use and all of us have, have ownership of. So, the right in CC, who are we and what we do? I'll also say, just before I dive into all this, if you do have any questions at any time, I, I think we have like, Nine minutes or something, <laughs> so um, I'm not going to fill all that. Feel free to put your hand up. I'm happy to take questions at any time, but we can also take questions at the end. So I'm going to go back to some basics here. What does the internet actually do? The internet is about allowing me to share information with you and for you to share information with me. So it's just it's data passing from one point on the network to another point. So for that to happen, each of those points needs to have what? An address. We need to know where that data is going to. So that could be a domain name, like example.com. It could be an email address to say, I'm going to send this to that person. But at the fundamental level of the internet itself, machines talking to machines, it's numbers. So you get a number which says where you are on the network. And there are two kinds of those numbers. I say here, I, they're called internet protocol addresses, and there's IPv4 addresses. 
And these are 32 bit numbers, so that's, we have two, the power of 32 of those, which is about 4 billion addresses. And that's what the internet was built on. When they designed the internet, they said, okay, we're going to use 32 bit addresses, that will dictate where all of this information goes. As I'll explain later, that whole plan kind of got superseded by the fact that we ran out of those 4 billion addresses. And so we now use, can use, 128 bit addresses which gives us many, many more, more and that's called IPv6. Don't ask where IPv5 comes into it, because it doesn't. So, what's an important thing about those addresses? Probably the most important thing is that they are unique. So if I'm trying to send information to you on the network, and you, you say, my num I'm num number 24, my address is 24, I need to know that someone over here is not going to be saying I'm address number 24 as well because then my information is just going to get split between the two and no one will get anything. So the way that we've ensured that uniqueness on a global level is regional internet registries and that's what Bright NCC does. It's one of five around the world. Those regional internet registries say we'll give you, ISP, internet service provider A, a block of IP addresses, you use those and we won't give those to anyone else and we will tell the world in the public database that you have these addresses. So that's really fundamental to making the internet work itself. The discussions and the decisions about how we actually make those allocations, who, we, who gets an address, what they have to prove or what they have to pay to get those addresses, that's decided by communities. It's not decided by the right at CC. It's not decided by any of these other organizations like ICANN or the ITU. It's decided by an open community process that anyone can take part in and that it comes to these decisions by consensus. That's also a really fundamental part of this, this process. So I mentioned there are five regional internet registries. This is them. Um, right in CC, as you can see, we have a service region that covers Europe, uh, Central Asia, Caucasus, Middle East, um, and then there's APA, which I started off working for, which covers all of the Asians. Each of those have their own community. Each of those have their own secretariat, like the Ryman CC, that carries out the wishes of those communities. And that's, that's how that process works. So when we talk about Ryman CC, the primary, these are the primary things that we are. We're secretariat to the right community. First and foremost, we will do what our community tells us to do. And that means implementing the policies that they come up with. It means bringing them together for events like right meetings. It means doing capacity building, educational sort of events, doing something like I'm doing here today. We serve the regional internet registry. That's, that's our second information task, and that's certainly the one that people tend to be most interested in. You're the regional internet registry. Make sure you do that job right. It's fully funded by members, so we're not a government organization, we're not a, an NGO in that sense, we're a not-for-profit membership organization. People join us, become members, and that, that funds us. And we're open, transparent, and neutral. Basically that means that our role has to be to carry out policy, implement policy, and do that in an impartial way, whether you're an, an internet service provider in Russia, or in Saudi Arabia or in the UK, you're going to get treated the same way, you're going to have to work with the right NCC according to the policies that our community has made. Now that's all, not always easy, and I'll get into more about that later, about where that can start to get a bit complicated when you start to deal with national legislation, um, governments that are taking a much stronger interest in these kinds of issues, and that are doing things that are not necessarily in coordination with each other. So this is going still to what we do as the registry, we distribute IP addresses as I mentioned. We maintain the right database, so this is a public database of all of that information that we collect um, on who has IP addresses. We contribute to a stable and innovative internet, we enable our members to operate and develop the internet, we provide by So I'll refer those other two above, that's a bit sort of marketing speak. Rivestat, Rive Atlas and other tools and services is something I'll talk about a little bit later. But this is one of the areas where 
the expertise that we have is actually something that can be used by our members, by governments, by law enforcement, by anyone who wants to look at how the network actually works. Where is the traffic going? If you're an internet service provider in Armenia and you want to send a mail from your user to a user on another network in Armenia, is it going via Frankfurt or is it going directly to your other customer? Because at the end of the day, that's going to make a really big difference to how much it costs in the long run. And we've seen certain situations where we have operators, particularly in the Middle East, whose traffic was always going all the way back to Europe, costing them a huge amount of money, making the internet less accessible. So by providing that information, by helping our members to analyze and understand what's going on with their traffic management, we're actually helping to make the internet more accessible, more affordable, more usable by people. So, the next step I want to talk about is our membership. And this is where things get, well, a bit about our business, but also about some broader trends that we're seeing in the internet going forward. That's our membership. And if you look to the left-hand side there, the right-hand side, you know, it's, it's going up pretty sharply. So that's good for us. We have lots more membership fees. It's nice that we can spend that money on things. Um, but it actually has a really significant meaning for the internet itself. Because the reason that it's doing that is that we run out of IPv4. So I mentioned earlier that we have IPv4 address space and that we ran out of those numbers. Basically, we used up all the forbidden. The right community, in an example of making policy, said, OK, we're going to take one last slash eight block, that's a, a large block of these addresses, and we're going to say, OK, we're going to not give out as many addresses as you need. We're only going to give to every member a small amount. And that will allow people to continue to build networks. Ideally, they'll build IPv6 networks, but they'll still need a little bit of IPv4 to actually connect with the internet itself. What is meant in practice is that as that as our reserves of IPv4 address space have gone down, many more people have said, OK, well, I need a little bit of IPv4 address space before it runs out. I need to get in there and get my, my small block and set up my own network. And so now, instead of just internet service providers, we have banks, we have enterprise organizations, we have small businesses coming in, setting up their own networks, getting that autonomy, which is great. But it's not a sustainable solution because we are going to run out. Probably in about two years, we're going to get to a point where we don't even have those small lots of IPv4 address space to get out. And that's where the discussion about IPv6 and the fact that the industry hasn't really adopted it to the extent that we hoped um, comes into play. Because if the internet is going to continue to grow, and if we have the internet of things producing millions and millions of new, new devices that need IP addresses, it will grow, then people need to have access to those addresses. And IPv6 is the way to do that, or at least the easiest way to do that. Um, because the alternatives make the internet look a little different than it does today. So if we look here, this is just trying to look at a little sense of what our membership looks like in Iran, Armenia, and Caucasus. Um, the numbers up the top there show where we're at. Um, you can see that uh, Armenia and Georgia are roughly on par for a lot of things. What's clear in this second graph here, the bar chart here, is that this shows the age of the members. And you can see that Georgia, the orange ones, has a lot more LIRS members that are much younger. So their industry, or at least their membership growth, is happening very strongly in the last couple of years. There are lots of new members coming on board. On the international side, not so much. It's sort of been much more stable, much more steady. That could mean a number of things. It could mean growth in the internet industry, or it could just mean that we have a lot more members trying to get their last bit of IPv4 rather than going to upstream providers to connect to the internet. But if we look over here then at V6 brightness, this is a, a metric that the Ripeness CC itself has developed to say, what's an industry in a given country? How, how ready is it to deploy IPv6? What have they actually done to get IPv6 onto their networks? 
And so the, the white, grey sections here, those are, the country, those are the operators in that country that have no IPv6. They don't have any, any IPv6 addresses, they're not even thinking about it. Now, in our median situation, that's pretty good. That's only a quarter of our members here. The rest actually have some IPv6, so that means that they're thinking about bringing IPv6, what, what they can do with IPv6 on their network. Unfortunately, this orange quarter here, they're, they're people who have an IPv6 address allocation, but have done nothing else. We don't see it on the network, we don't see any activity going on with it, so while it's great that there's a big chunk of I mean, in membership that has IPv6, what we want to see is more people actually doing something with it, putting it onto their networks, starting to, to play with it, or possible connect their customers using that. This is sort of an example of what the world looks like in terms of IPv6 adoption, and you can see Armenia is not doing so well there. 0.01% um, of IPv6 traffic is going over IPv6. Um, yeah, it's not great. There's no solution spinning that, really. Um, if you compare that to Belgium, where we see about 53% of traffic is going over V6, or India, where 32% is going over V6. What What's going on there? Um, well, what we do know is that big providers can play a really big change in this, in this situation. So in India, one of their major uh, mobile service providers turned on IPv6 for their customers. Well, you went from 5% to 35%. Belgium, again, a couple of big operators doing a lot of work there to bring it on. But the other interesting thing about Belgium is the work that's been going on between the public sector and the private sector. So you have the government working really closely with operators, private sector operators, to make sure that they all understand what's going on to try and mitigate that sense of competition because the competition between operators can be a real disincentive to IPv6 adoption um, because it costs money, it costs resources to deploy IPv6 and if you've got three competitors or two competitors all working at sort of minimal margins to out, out spend each other or to get, get customers, the idea that you're going to invest more resources in IPv6 probably doesn't seem like a great short-term strategy, even if in the long term it's the only strategy that's going to really ensure your place in the market. So what we're seeing is a lot of short-term thinking, um, and it's trying to shift the market to that longer-term thinking. But the flip side of all of this is that while you can get as much up, I can be six space as you need for free, or at least for the membership fee for an RAR, and you can't get IPv4 space for free as you need from an RAR. You can buy an IPv4 address space. So there are big operators, many of them in the US or some of them in Western Europe, who have lots of IPv4 address space, maybe they're even moving to IPv6, and they can sell off that IPv4 address space. And that's a really fundamental change because now we're going from a situation where the internet can grow without any sort of consideration of it's going to cost money to I mean, obviously the infrastructure and the devices will cost money, but to actually get the number of sources you need, that's not a problem, that's not going to cost you money. If P6 doesn't take off, and we stay with P4, IP addresses become a scarce resource, and that shifts the, the paradigm for the whole internet development market, development structure, because it becomes, okay, if you have the money, you can grow your network. If you don't have the money, you're probably not going to get to grow the network. And that's a, that's a problem. That's something that we need to look at in terms of development. It's something we look at, need to look at in terms of how do we connect the last billion. Because that's what the discussion has shifted from. In the last few years, it was, it was how do we connect the next billion. And right now, about, according to UN stats, three and a half billion people, around 50% of the planet, are connected. So now the question is, how do we connect that last billion? How do we overcome barriers of poverty, geography, cultural differences to actually connect everyone on the planet to the internet. And this is coming along at a pretty unfortunate time for that because we suddenly start to add in an element of you need to pay to actually grow that network. That's not going to help. 
But transfers are happening now. So this is just a little overview of what's happening here in Armenia and the surrounding countries. What you can see in the blue areas are uh, transfers that happen within a country. And a lot of the time that's companies merging or one company buying another company. So that, that can happen a lot of the churn in the industry anyway. But we see that in Armenia, in the last few years, we've had more IPv4 addresses brought into the country than we have coming out. In Azerbaijan, significantly more coming in than going out. Whereas Georgia, nothing coming in, but some coming out. So it's, it's an interesting way to look at it. And part of what we want to do, talking to you, talking to our members here, is understand what the dynamics are driving that. Because every country is different, every country sort of has a different approach to this. We see some countries that are massive exporters of IP addresses, and they're not necessarily the big rich countries. We see others that are buying up a lot of the forager space, and they're not necessarily the rich ones, but it's a different, it depends on what their industry is prioritizing and what their plan is for the future. So this is where I start to get a little bit into right and CC market and upgrade and what we can do with you and what we can um, how we can help and what we're doing with people here in Armenia. Basically we do a lot of engagement. Um, we've had a member lunch there, we've worked with the Armenian School of Internet Governance, which I know a few people in the room have been involved in. Um, we do academic engagement like this one. Uh, and the LEA workshop we had earlier this year. Again, working with law enforcement because that's a really significant stakeholder these days, whether we want to acknowledge that or not. And over recent years, we've done a number of things here in Armenia to, to build up the community. Um, starting in 2015, the regional meeting, um, a larger Eurasian regional meeting in 2016, and then taking some of you, I know some people in the room coming to the Middle East Network Operators Group in Iran earlier this year. And I think one of the things that we've spoken a lot about with people today, um, I've had a number of different meetings, is the location of Armenia, very much at that sort of crux of the, the sort of Russian Eurasian industry, the Middle East industry, and the European industry. You had an opportunity to engage with really all of those different stakeholders and to play a role as a bridging um, space for a lot of discussions and a lot of, a lot of um, decision making there. And that's also some training courses we've done. Um, these, are, these are mainly training courses we do with our members um, over the last few years, uh, but it's focused much more on sort of technical, practical, hands-on training. Um, and so if you're a member, or a member organization, please let us know. I think we're looking at doing some more training um, in Armenia next year. So we're certainly happy to, to schedule that. But strengthening the local community, this is stepping a bit away from what we're doing as Rock NCC and looking at how some of these stronger local communities can really contribute to um, well, shaping the future of the internet. Network operator groups is a model that I guess we've been really supportive of and seen do some really impressive things in a number of different countries. And this could be ranged from anything from like a really official kind of conference setup to uh, occasional drinks at a bar where you bring together different operators to a mailing list or a telegram list or whatever people want to use to communicate. But it's basically just an opportunity to allow the operators, technical people in a, in a given country, to work together, to get a little bit beyond the competition and to identify common problems, common solutions. Um, because that's really what right, the right community was built on. It was about saying, yes, we're in competition. Yes, this is a business. Uh, this is, this is a, a private sector operation. But the internet works best when we all work together. It's not going to do me and my customers any good if they can't contact someone on your network. So we need to be able to have that bridge, have that, that interoperability there. And something like a network operator group is a really fundamental part of that. And on a small scale, is the same as what Prime is on that larger regional scale. 
brings people together, gives them an opportunity to share, share information. And that could be technical information, but it can also be legal information, discussion of regulatory issues, um, discussion of development issues. All of this stuff plays into what the internet is, what the internet will look like in the future. Uh, we have lots of networks in the service region. Um, that's a map with a few of them. There are 25. We don't, well, we do currently have one in sort of embryonic form in Armenia, as I understand it. Um, but hopefully that will that will grow a little bit more in the coming months and years, and we're happy to be supporting that. Um, if you're interested in doing more on that, we do have a bunch of resources, and I'm sure these slides will be available. There are a few links here that um, have brought together some of the information that we've gathered over the years about what can make a, a successful NOG, what different NOG operators are trying to do to bring the community together. Tools and services. Sorry, the, the marketing continues here a little bit, but this is also some, I hope, resources that would be really useful to those of you who are interested in getting a bit more involved in shaping that future. Um, we do webinars. I mentioned we were doing a lot of face-to-face -face courses here, but that's not going to be for everyone, and we do have a lot of webinars online that can actually provide more information, whether it's about hands-on IPv6 deployment, using the right database, or something like internet governance, or even the, the KSK rollover. I think we've done one. That's something that if you're involved in ICANN, you might be familiar with. I won't go into more details otherwise. Edgeco is another extension of that, um, and that's something that we do in a sort of single day, a bunch of presentations back to back over the course of eight hours, um, but on a single topic. So it's about this kind of like a conference without actually bringing everyone together in the same room in the same country. And that's, I think, something that we've really realized in the last few years. The solution to where all of these problems can't be everyone gets on a plane and flies to London, or everyone gets on a plane and flies to Moscow. We need to use the internet and actually do this capacity building in a way that people can access without spending all that money, without spending all that time in travel. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is one of the options that we're looking at expanding on with that. And then finally, in this section, Bright Academy um, is something similar, but something that we're building on to actually certify people. And so this would be more aimed at professionals and giving professional certification in things like IPv6 adoption or um, managing the right database, managing an LIR account with the right CC. I mentioned before that we do a lot of analysis and measurements. And this is a section of the presentation that's often a bit longer when I have my technical um, colleagues here to discuss it. Um, but Ripe Atlas and the ISP Country Jedi, which we base on that Ripe Atlas model, is something that is, is really of great use and great value, I think, to the community but something that can be of even more use and value if more people become involved. The basic model is probes, and we have probably some of them around here, small USB probes that people can take and plug into their network. Using the right Atlas interface, you can then look at how traffic will travel from your probe to any one of the other 10,000 probes that we have online. And you can say, okay, well, my traffic is going from here to there to there to there. Maybe it would be better if it was going from here to there. And so that means you can adjust your network, adjust your settings, and say, okay, we're going to do this in a more efficient way. That's helpful for network operators. It gives them a chance to be more efficient about how they're using their energy, how they're doing their, their operations. We've also found recently it's useful for law enforcement. They can look at where traffic is going, who's actually responsible for, um, for certain traffic, and that can be useful in, in legal proceedings. Um, we see in governments take an interest. They have an interest in what their national industry is doing. Um, and actually, even something like the discussion around internet shutdowns, which happened a lot last year. There were shutdowns in, in Africa, in various parts of the Middle East. If we have the probes, we can actually see where the traffic is being routed. We can look at what's actually going on there. 
So as, as you can imagine, this becomes more effective the more probes we have. If we had a probe in every network in the world, we would be able to look at where traffic went um, all around the internet. We're not there yet. Uh, I think we have 22 active probes currently in Armenia. Um, so if you have any interest, I'll get you to talk to my colleague Bahan, and I'm sure we'll be able to get, get your probe to plug into your network. <laughs> and that would be really useful. Um, but this is what I mentioned before about using that to see where traffic goes. So in this, in this square here, you can see the networks that we have um, right at this probe in. And so each of these squares shows traffic going from here to here, or here to here. And if they're green, that means the traffic is staying within the country. It's not actually going outside. If they're yellow or orange, that means that it is going outside. And if you look here, we can see what that, that actual traffic exchange model looks like. So you have three major operators here, and you can see them sharing traffic and exchanging traffic with each other. Um, so this can be useful, and if you yeah, feel free to use the QR code or go to the link there, as I said, it will also be in the slides. Finally, we also, well not finally, but we also give away money. <laughs> um, I mentioned that we have a lot of membership growth. Part of what our executive board has decided to do with that is look at how we can fund projects that are for the good of the internet. And so this is looking at non-commercial activities, um, things that can build out internet connection in developing areas or in rural parts, things that look at enhancing security or further developing other, other aspects of the internet infrastructure. Each year we have 250,000 euros and we're dividing that up. Well, we're now currently about to announce our second round um, of annual recipients. But in both of those, we've had around six, I think, projects that we've given money to. Uh, so the next round will open in March next year. If you have any projects that you're working on or you know of, know of any, please feel free to share that information. We'd be really interested to hear about new, interesting, innovative kinds of projects in non-commercial space that we could be helping out with some funding. Um, yeah. That's a few of the principles. Um, you can go through that in yeah, your own time. As I say, the main priority is that it be for the good of the internet, non-commercial, and something of use to the whole community, or at least a, a significant section of the community. Internet governance. This is probably the area of right NCC that I've been most involved in in my time there. Um, and it's something that has really developed in the last 10, 15 years. In 2003, 2005, there was a, something called the World Summit on the Information Society that kicked off. And what it really marked was the moment when governments all around the world, particularly in the UN context, looked at the internet and said, hang on, we need to be a bit more involved here. A lot of people from the operator community, private sector, saw this and said, well, hang on, um, we're doing just fine without you. We probably don't need governments looking over our shoulder here. And neither of those positions was ever going to win out. So the, the solution devised in that world, some of the information society, was an approach that they called a multi-stakeholder approach. And it was about bringing together all different sides in that, that discussion to in processes that would actually allow people to make decisions. This is not my graphic, but it shows how complex some of those um, structures can be. Um, you see the regional internet registries, that's somewhere here, that's us. But you also have the Internet Society. You also have the W3C, which manages the um, World Wide Web Protocol, um, network operator groups, the IGF, Internet Governance Forum, the Internet Engineering Task Force, uh, ICANN, which you're probably familiar with, which manages the DNS, the domain name system. So all of these, those are, those are the sort of ISTAR associations, as we call them, that actually have responsibility for 
the architecture of the internet, the fundamental mechanism of how the internet works. For those ISTAR organizations and the people that they work with need to also work then with governments, the regulators. And they need to work with the academics and the technologists who are actually coming up with new ideas. They need to work with the private sector, whether it's Google, Facebook, Amazon, or smaller operators, you know, the, the small ISP that's just doing a boutique service for the business. And more and more recently, they have to also work with civil society. And this is where issues like privacy are really coming to the fore. Civil society is working both with governments and with operators and coming into these sort of forums like the Internet Governance Forum and, and having a really loud voice. And so that's something that's changed the discussion considerably. The right that you see in the right community position is based in these discussions, uh, is based on some, I guess, fundamental principles. Most of which are probably self-explanatory, but I'll go through them anyway. The internet operates across national borders. That's clear. The value of the internet is in being able to connect with people elsewhere in the world. What that means is that a national regulatory model really doesn't fit very well to internet regulation. And a lot of the discussions and the debates and the controversy around internet governance has sprung from that. Has sprung from one country saying, this is going to be the regulation for the internet in my country. Which leads to the second point here, which is that actions can have far-reaching consequences. Because the internet operates across borders, when country A says, this is going to be the regulation, I'm going to do this, Yes, it may affect their citizens. Yes, they might achieve what they want there, but it might also affect the citizens in the country next door or the country on the other side of the world. And at that point, you start to run into issues of sovereignty, um, governments, not wanting other governments making the rules for them. And in terms of internet governance, we see this in the technical realm. So we see countries blocking certain traffic, and that means that traffic can't go through and has to go around and costs more. But we also see it in other legal instruments and the GDPR discussion in the EU right now, which is the General Directive on Privacy Regulation. Privacy Regulation, yes. Um, is a really good example of that because one of the primary industries affected by it is that when the EU says you can't collect private information or we'll find you. That's affecting internet service providers or internet operators on the other side of the planet who have customers in Europe. And so you suddenly see this law that was made for EU countries is affecting many, many, many businesses and individuals on the other side of the planet, which raises a whole lot of people's um, ire or unhappiness. So as a positive message, and, and it is a positive message, Bottom up, a bottom-up approach to policy making is often the best fit for internet governance. And this is, some, this is an approach that really draws on the model the IETF was based on, the model that the RAR committees were based on. It's to say, these discussions aren't going to happen behind closed doors. They're going to happen in an open forum. Anyone who has an interest can join in. If you're a government, if you're a law enforcement, if you're an operator, you can all come to the discussion and contribute. We're going to reach decisions according to consensus. So it's not a vote, it's not someone, everyone puts up their hands and the most votes has the right answer. It's we're going to look at your issues or your problems with this policy proposal. We're going to make sure all of those are addressed or are addressed in some way or another. And then if we, we can do that, we move forward. But in all of this, and there are, we base this on right and based on IETF, there are many more examples nowadays of broader um, multi stakeholder approaches to this. And one example is the IMA transition, which happened a couple of years ago, where the US government, in the sort of last days of the Obama administration, decided that it would give up its oversight of the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority which is sort of the top of the hierarchy when it comes to IP addresses. And this was a pretty un unanticipated thing. You know, a government sort of stepping back and saying, okay, we're just going to give away this power. But the process that they set in place to do that was multi-stakeholder. It brought in governments from all over the world. It brought in 
technologists, operators, <coughs> and basically force them to sit together and come up with a proposal to say, this is what we're going to do with IANA. If you give up IANA, this is what the new model will look like. And that succeeded um, in the very dark days of the Obama administration. I think we finally passed the US Congress in like October of 2016. But so that's one example. The other really fundamental principle here is that the existing government structures, and RIFE is one of those, need to be recognized in all of this. They need to be recognized both for the authority they have, which is to say you don't have other bodies coming in and trying to take over that authority, but also for the limitations they have, that RIFE is not going to be dealing with issues of content online. That's not something that's relevant to us. There are other, other avenues and other um, spaces where that could be discussed. But to try and put all this into something like Rive or something like ICANN doesn't make sense and doesn't work in terms of a multi-stakeholder approach. So a lot of when you talk about what the ICU, the International Telecommunication Union, is doing, a big part of the discussion there is saying on technical private private on the private sector side, so like Rive is saying, we're already doing this. There is a process of making regulation or policy in IP address management. And so when you have governments in the ITU sort of saying, we're more comfortable doing it in the ITU, there needs to be that pushback to say, it's duplicating work. This is not, there is a space for doing this, and that you need to adapt to what that space looks like. So I'm coming to the end of, of my um, little section here, and this is where I tell you all to get involved. Um, I would normally say join us at our next right meeting. It's in Amsterdam, but it's next week. So I would instead say join us at our next next right meeting, which is in May next year in Reykjavik, um, 20 to 24th of May. And also, the Eurasian Network Operator Group meeting happens in June next year in uh, Tbilisi, so it's a little close to home. The important thing to note here is that we do have a number of options for funding um, to help you get involved here. We have right fellowships, um, and so this is a sort of open fellowship. You can apply um, statewide. I think it would be useful for you to be at a right meeting to get involved in those discussions, uh, and that will cover travel expenses. And we have RACI, which is our academic cooperation initiative. Um, and that's more for people who are students or researchers or in academic institutions. And if you have, that's where if you have a project or you have work that you would like to talk about, um, you would like to present to the community, um, then you get feedback from the operational community. We'll again provide travel funding um, accommodation to get you there. And that's for right meetings like the one in Reykjavik, but also for ENOGS, Eurasian Network Operating Group, MEDOG, the Middle East one, um, and a few others. And this is a few um, Armenians who've already taken up fellowship opportunities at, with RIP and RIP NCC. Um, and that's our CEO, Axel. He's not a fellow. It's <laughs> <laughs> also not the best photo of him, but that's great. <laughs> Um, that's it from me at this point. Um, we do have plenty of time still, so I want to sort of throw it open uh, to what you guys, if you have any questions or any comments. I think, yeah, you were promised the future of the internet. I probably haven't gone exactly into the future of the internet here in the way that you were expecting. Um, and I'm happy to sort of take discussion or questions about what you see as the big challenges for the future of the internet, and it could be IoT or AI or Skynet or Terminators or whatever it is. Um, because I think at the end of the day, all of that still kind of comes under this topic of how are we actually going to manage that as a society? How are we going to manage that as a community? Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I will just add uh, a few bits about uh, the opportunities to follow. Why is it not such a joke? I'll take that in. I'll edit it in Armenian. Okay, it's okay if my sister is Yeah, I don't know what it's Yeah. Well, so tonight, um, can you go to this opportunities part for red fellowships, etc.? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Nigel, uh, get your mic, hold some
make uh, uh, replay me back on I as uh, the next one. No, 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 it's before that. Crazy, crazy. Crazy. Crazy, crazy. Yeah, crazy. Now, I guess for picking in chat, but not small, simple, and also make some of the other way back to you. Why is it a home? In the case of my home, whole number of other group names in chat. Bruschutan, Gurat, Bruschutan, IOT Mastin, and also in Finance, and then I got a Mastin, and also in Blockchain, and I got a Bitcoin, and I got a Bitcoin, and I got a Do uh, 
Cioè, di che culo? Ah, ah, e che quali quali sono i giornali stessi? 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 Quali sono Dimmi un po' se non è che 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 non è e ciò che ho fatto è che ho fatto un po' di lavoro. Ok, il GDPR è già. 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 Il GDPR è Right, 
So we'll launch in Ripe 78 in Reykjavik. Yeah, it will be launched there. So we just started as Community Projects Fund of uh, Grande Yamar, Community Projects mm -hmm. Fund, the Lukar, we met with Mustadi Arte, or the Mustadi Arte, and we checked with Mustadi Arte. Is Kakatron there? Is Kakatron there? Is Kakatron there? Ich 
Regarding political processes uh, with blockchain and uh, using big data. <laughs> So it's about the internet development, general equation, uh, governing political processes using blockchain and big data. <laughs> um, it, I think it's an interesting possibility. I, I think that blockchain itself is a technology that still probably needs a lot more research and development and that's going into it. And I think there are things like um, Bitcoin that are probably driving that in certain directions. Um, other organizations like the ITU are certainly looking into this now a lot more closely um, and, and taking interest. That means governments are certainly taking interest. This is not something that's just happening on the fringe of the sort of technical community now. It's actually something that governments and policymakers are paying close attention to. Uh, that said, I think it's probably a long way from actually being implemented um, in, in a sort of successful way. But I mean, possibly things like voting um, fraud or tampering or, or vote, vote integrity might further sort of drive that with government. So we may see something like that develop in the future. I, I mean, I think we sort of see already some, some national governments, and Estonia is the one that's always um, held up as an example, who are, who are really working with that e-government model and who have already implemented a lot of, a lot of activity um, doing that. But we also see that that, that opens them up to uh, certain risks because cybersecurity is, is not something that is a, a perfect science or is something that you can absolutely protect against. So if you're known to be the country that is putting all of your voter and consumer and data into, into the system and doing it all using, using the internet, you open yourself up as a target for um, hackers and other cyber security threats. Uh, so I think there's a, there's a balance that needs to be struck there. Uh, looking forward uh, to the future of the internet. You know, in Armenia we established, yes, established, but we, but uh, the communities established quantum lab. And do you have like uh, looking forward that uh, maybe the quantum networks will be future of the internet, and how you do research in this field? Mm. So this is I, that's a, a good point in terms of it's actually some something that we've already had um, discussed a little at the right meeting in <laughs> a couple a couple of right meetings ago. But it was someone who came in through our academic cooperation initiative. Um, there's at least one university in the Netherlands that's doing a lot of work on quantum computing, um, which I was, was leading back in the day. I think there's a lot of work going on elsewhere, as you say now, um, even here in Armenia. Um, and, and it's certainly something that the networking community is paying attention to. Um, and I, I know that the developments in China are about Sort of claiming that it's, it's quite far advanced, but I don't think we've seen um, the operator community really doing anything pro in, in, to, to prepare for that yet. I think it's, it's a topic for research. It's, it's absolutely a topic for research, and it's a topic for us of the kind of research that we really would like to see come into the right community because it's at, it's at that phase of the research where getting feedback from operators, getting feedback from people who actually use this in a business context yeah. is vital. They need to sort of say, no, that's crazy, that'll never scale, or yes, that's something we could use for this, or for this, or for this. In fact, our university for the moment uh, search for, in fact, our university search for the moment some uh, topics for the uh, PhD projects, joint PhD projects uh, with uh, participation of the master's students maybe from different fields. And uh, it uh, will be one of the, our proposals for the uh, upcoming year, six months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I would certainly suggest that they look at, at the racing program and whether they Thank you. Yeah, enter and come, come and present that to the right community. Mm -hmm. yeah.